not get caught up in the obstacles of the difficulties of where we're at right now. Let's remember where we've got to be. Because I can't tell you when and I can't tell you where, but I know at some point the moment's going to come when you're going to be called upon to do something great. It's going to happen. And it's how well you prepared yourself in advance and the people around you and their leadership that is directly proportional to the success of your mission. Planning, training, and leadership. It's those three things. So make sure they're as good as they can be. And in our job, the proportions are measured in lives lost. So we don't want to lose any lives. I want to make sure that everybody gets home. So I trained my guys as good as they could be, and I planned everything as well as I thought I could plan at my level, and I made sure that everybody knew their job as absolute experts. Now, if this is the north, remember, we're coming in on a helicopter. Here's the way it's going to work. If you can imagine a building in the middle of a city. So there's a street running this way, and there's a street running that way. The Little Bird helicopters come in first. Little Bird helicopters are a bubbled helicopter. They have a glass with two men in the seats. They have skids on the side, and we would put benches on the sides of those skids so that the Delta guys could sit on the bench, and then the Little Bird could land on the roof, and the Delta guys could just step right off, and the Little Birds take off. The Blackhawks would come in right behind them, and we would land at one, two, three, and four corners of that building, and the Rangers would rope out and put a perimeter around the building so that the guys on the inside knew that they could clear the rooms and not have to worry about people coming in from the outside. So that was the idea. As we come down the street, my, guy, my job in the door as the, as the team leader was only was very simple. They gave me two tasks. The first task was to identify the target building and confer with the crew chief. I'm like, okay, simple enough. Now, I don't know how many people in here have seen rooftop photographs of buildings in Mogadishu. Uh, I'm going to tell you that a rooftop in Mogadishu looks pretty much like a rooftop in Atlanta. Uh, I couldn't tell you if that was the Olympic Hotel or where it was the Home Depot. I, I was, I, and worst of all, you couldn't see anything because there was dirt. The helicopter's 50 feet off the ground. 50 feet off the ground, there's dirt kicking and swirling up into the aircraft. You can't see anything. You can barely see buildings going by. And I'm going, oh man, I hope they don't think I know what I'm doing. <laughs> And I'm looking through the windshield of the aircraft and I see the two pilots and Chief Brown is talking to Chief Wood and I got the headset on. Chief Brown looks at Chief Wood and goes, hey, can you see anything? I can't see squat. <laughs> Maybe the Blackhawks got some special dust busting equipment that I don't know about. But I don't know how the pilots see where they're going, but I never had to doubt the pilots. I knew that somehow they would put us on the money. Do you know why I knew they were going to put us on the money? It wasn't because they were my buddies. We didn't hang out. We didn't talk about Christmas together. They had a job to do. And Chief Brown knew that he was the one piece of the puzzle that made every single thing work. Every bit of that task force, the millions of dollars that were being spent to send us over there, all hinged upon him. It really did. It was his job to put us on the money, because if he didn't put us on the money, it meant our squad was someplace else. And if we were someplace else, we weren't being covered, and we were screwed. And that meant that corner of the building was not being covered, and the inside of the building was not being covered, and lives were on the line because Chief Brown didn't put us on the money. It was his job, and he knew it. So every single time, he executed and executed well. And when he flared that aircraft, and I see, I can, oh, I can see the building now. I saw the little birds coming out of the dirt. I could see the Delta operators crashing the doors. I could see explosives going off, and I could hear gunfire on the objective. For all practical purposes, it was, it was what they call a hot LZ. Now, the birds start to flare, and they yell ropes. And the ropes kick out both sides of the helicopter. One goes here, one goes there. There's my squads on the left, another squad on the right. Now, when you fast rope out, you're not, you're not rappelling. So you're not hooked in, you're not harnessed in. It's just, you just grab a rope and go. You got a pair of gloves on. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna the science teachers and the math teachers can help people out on this one. I'm a, there's, the, my second job was very important. It was to kick the rope out and make sure that the bottom of the rope hits the ground. Now remember, if the bird is 50 feet off the ground, the rope's 60 feet long. That gives you 10 feet of leeway. Now, if the bird happens to be 70 feet off the ground, what happens when you reach the end of the rope? See, you want some cool word problems for your kids? Let's, let's give them that one. Because you laugh, because that learning comes hard, because somebody did it one night. They kicked the rope out and went down. There was no more rope. <laughs> wow! So make sure the bottom of the rope hits the ground. When it hits the ground, you send your guys, and they reach out. Now remember, there's this thing called gravity, and it works at 9.8 meters per second squared, and it will yank you out of an aircraft whether you are ready to go or not. Very important that you have a hold of the rope before you lean. 
One of our guys, Todd Blackburn, had reached for the rope, but the bird had yanked because it got hit with an RPG, it's a rocket, and Todd fell. He fell 50 feet and he was out. Bam! Broke his back. But we had planned for a casualty on infill. We weren't happy about it. Shouldn't be working. I, I, I hate that this has happened. This is not good. But we planned for it. But it took four guys to move Todd. And it took two Humvees that were waiting over in the wings to drive up and put him on board and drive him away. And we had planned for a casualty, but this was a very, right away, the mission took on a very serious tone. Because there was gunfire going off, the headset screaming, we got a casualty behind us on the helicopter in the rear. I'm the last man out of my bird. As I reach for the rope, I look at the crew chief who's standing right here in front of me, and his name was Ned Norton. Ned looks, at this point you can picture him, he looks like Darth Vader, because he's got his blast shields down like this, and he's got a mask on, and he had stuck this sticker across his helmet, it was red, white, and blue, and it said, no fear. Very proud of this sticker, Ned was. And he's looking at me, he's going, remember, no fear, no fear. You know, now man, there's gunfire going off, and no fear, and I'm like, screw you. <laughs> <laughs> because it's very easy for Ned to say no fear when he's flying away. <laughs> See it. So, but when we hit the ground, man, we were right where we needed to be. I really didn't. It was from right from here to there to the corner of the building. And we were now there were people when we hit the ground. Yes, there were people firing at us, and it, they were shooting our way. But it wasn't. It wasn't that bad. And, and as many as many times as I say this, I still think I go, boy, that sounds funny. There were people shooting at us, and it wasn't that bad. But. It wasn't that bad mainly because they were missing. And that's the preferred outcome when people shoot at you. Do your best to make a miss. And 35 minutes into the mission, it was done. The mission was done. The Delta guys had rounded up 12 of the bad guys that were in that room. Now, Adid wasn't in the building, we knew that, but 12 of his people were, and we got them. The Humvees came driving up from there, out there waiting on the wings of the city, put the bad guys on the trucks, the trucks drive away. We are waiting to go home. The mission is done, it's exfil. I'm already thinking about finishing the letter home to mom. I'm a dear mom, you're never gonna believe what happened. I'm a combat veteran. I could qualify for a VA loan. This is, <laughs> this is great. And just like that, the unthinkable happens. Just like that. The first helicopter got shot down, and it got shot down right above us. And we saw it go down, and it went down about five blocks. Now that's the north, it was five blocks. So three blocks this way, and about a left-hand turn, two blocks up that way. And everything changed. The mission was done. We were supposed to be heading home. That didn't right. That didn't fair. That shouldn't be. How can that be happening? But there it was, and what are you going to do about it? Fortunately, we had made a plan. What if the unthinkable happens and a bird goes down? Here's how we will react. It was within moving distance on foot, so that's exactly what we were going to do. So now you've got about 125 guys who are on the ground, and we're all going to pick up, and we're going to move to this crash site and try and secure the crash site, because we knew what happened if there was no one there to help our people who were on that bird. If any of them survived, if there was nobody there to help, they weren't, they weren't going to survive because the mob was going to overrun that crash site. It became a foot race. We've got to get up and we've got to get there. Now there was a rescue helicopter that got there quick. And this is where I'm sure some of you guys know, I'm sure some of those Air Force CCT guys and PJs are heroes and legends because those guys were in on that rescue bird fighting at that helicopter before any of us got there to save lives and keep the bad guys away. But we got to pick up and we got to move. Now just before we get ready to go, remember my, Doug, my, my buddy Doug from Texas, he He's holding his neck, and I see him, and he's bleeding, and he runs inside the building, and the medic follows him in, and about three minutes later, Sergeant Watson comes out and says to me, he goes, hey, Bourne's been hit, you're in charge. I go, what happened to him, Sergeant? Is he going to be okay? He said, Bourne's been hit, you're in charge. I go, yeah, but what's, what's wrong with his neck, Sergeant Watson? He goes, hey, look at me. He said, you're in charge, Sergeant Thomas. That, that wasn't fair. It wasn't right. I didn't want that responsibility. I didn't even know if I was ready for it, but there it was. And what are you going to do about it? Well, fortunately, we had planned for that. What if the guy in charge goes down? What are you going to do? Well, I knew I didn't have to be happy about it, but I knew what to do. So I grabbed Doug's radio, and I stuck it on my hip, and I took the medical bag off, and I handed it to Jesus. I said, to Jesus, you're the team leader now, brother. Roger, sir, in Puerto Rico, everybody's a team leader. <laughs> Wow. 
Floyd, look after Saransky. Saransky, look after Floyd. If you do what you know is right, we're going to make it out of here. Let's go. And we pick up and we start to move down the street. Now, we're the last guys in this long line of men on both sides of the street, heading this three blocks down that way. Well, now, Floyd starts yelling. And he's like, there was somebody shooting, and he was over that way, and he was getting close. And Floyd sees him. And Floyd's like, hey. Hey, Sergeant Thomas. Hey, he's up in the tree, Sergeant Thomas. Hey, Sergeant, he's up in the tree. I can't hear anything because there's so much noise going on. I'm like, Floyd, what? He goes, he's up in the tree, Sergeant. And Sergeant Watson hears him, though, and yells across the street, Hey, Floyd, do you see him? And Floyd's like, yeah, Sergeant, he's up in the tree. Yeah, I heard you. If you see him, why don't you shoot at him? <laughs> that would be the light bulb going off above his head. Floyd figured it out. I'm not trying to make light of the situation, but Floyd figures like, oh, I enlisted into the army and I'm a machine gunner. <laughs> and he put his, I said, Floyd, shoot back. And he put his head down. He charged that weapon and he fired. Then they teach you to sh when you shoot a machine gun, a machine gun should be shot in what they call a five to a seven round burst. And you do that. You, you, so it sounds sort of like this. It's like, ga 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 and you give it a little bit of a break every now and then so that the barrel won't overheat. Floyd was a little bit excited and he was I'm like, Floyd, Floyd! And it was glowing by this time. I'm like... Like the little redneck that he was. He stands up and takes his goggles off and puts them on his head and goes, Did I get him? And I, I tell you the truth, I, I'm not, I do not know if Floyd got that guy, but he got the whole tree. <laughs> That's a technique. Good shot, Floyd. Let's go. Now, when we made that first hand turn, that first left turn, we couldn't, there wasn't much more that we could push in. And everybody always asked, well, how was it like the movie? And I said, well, at that point, it was, it was Hollywood. I mean, there were so many rounds coming down the street from rangers. You could see tracer rounds, and there were so many rounds coming in from the bad guys, from doorways and alleys and rooftops. It was nuts. But for me, it kind of felt like training. I felt like, okay, we're shooting, we're moving, we're communicating. I got my guys in a good place. I, I pushed them in about 30 yards, and they turned around. We, we've all got our little sectors of fire. And it was training up until the first guy got hit. When the first guy goes down, it snaps you into a whole nother level of reality. And I still to this day have not figured out a great way to explain it. Other than, one, I know physically you get what, like a spider sense. You get very cognizant of what's going on you in a, in a 360 degree. Your senses are on overload because your brain is getting pumped full of chemicals that are putting your senses on, on overdrive. But it, it also, you start feeling this lump in your chest and it starts coming up into your throat and it's called panic. And you start wondering, man, can I, I don't think I can handle this. And that is when everybody finds this big thing that we all want to have. We all want to be, we put it on our wall lockers in the hallways. We, we tell our, we want our people at church and our family and our kids, we all want to have people of character. And when you find your character is when you are facing the worst of times. Because that's when you're asked to do something above and beyond what you would normally do. Your brain is telling you run away and hide. That's what it's telling you to do. It's telling you to survive. And nobody would have noticed if just one guy had kind of stood behind the wall and maybe every now and then poked his head out. No one would have noticed and no one would have blamed him. But what would have happened if he had done that and fallen out? He would have left the person on the left and the person on the right hanging. And they would have been in trouble because he couldn't do his job. And you saw people stepping up. You saw young guys, 19, 20 year old folks, stepping up and doing incredible things in the name of character. Because I, I promise, you've heard it, I promise you, there is no such thing as a hero who was not scared. But he did the right thing anyway because there were people counting on him. That's why, that's why. The only reason you're gonna step forward in the face of something that's overwhelming. And it doesn't, please, it doesn't have to be combat. You've all seen it. You've seen stories. People who've stepped forward and done amazing things, why did they do it? They did it because it had to be done. You don't have to be happy about it, but what are you gonna do about it? Okay, 
The first guy that I saw go down was Earl. Earl Filmer was a Delta operator. And he was, remember now, this is the super soldier. These are the guys that are as good as it gets. And they're not supposed to get shot. And there it was. He got hit. And I ran over to go see if I could help. And his team leader, Sergeant Hooten, says, hey, man, we got to get him medevaced. And I run back to Sergeant Watson. I said, Sergeant Watson, I got to get this guy out of here. How do and Sergeant Watson already knew because he had heard on the radio. Another helicopter got shot down. So we now had two birds on the ground and we only had enough resources to get to that one. So he knew that they weren't gonna send another helicopter and risk it to land so that we could medevac one man. And he says, well, can we move them out on foot? And I run back and I say, hey, Sergeant Hooten, what if we move them out on foot? We'll call the Humvees, they'll come back and get us. And Sergeant Hooten, Hooten looks at me and very, very matter of fact, like, just says, nah, man, don't worry about it, he's dead. And it's, it's, he's dead. To this day, it bothers me how little that seemed to affect me at the moment. Because I felt like I had a job to do. You gotta drive on, you gotta move through it, I got things I gotta do, yeah, he's dead, okay, we've been trained for that, he's a KIA, what do you do? But I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you, this was another one of those moments that changed the direction of my thought for a lifetime. I do not come in here to preach. I'm, I'm, I do not come in here to preach, but I'm going to tell you, if you've never been a believer, and that there's a soul inside of a human being, and it goes someplace else when that body dies, uh, if, you don't, if, you don't, if you don't subscribe to that point of view, I'm going to tell you you're dead wrong, because you've never been there when someone dies. I don't know who it was or what it was. I knew Earl Fillmore, and that was not, it may have resembled him, but it was about as lifeless as that piece of wood right there. It was a suitcase of nothing. It, he didn't look like he was sleeping. He didn't look like he was playing dead in the movies. Done. I know when that man died because 13 seconds ago when I ran away he was still alive and when I came back I was like whoa and now I knew what my mission had become my mission was not about the crash site it was not about the greater glory of the Ranger Regiment or the, the, the medals or the CNN headline story it was that that was not gonna happen to my three guys that was it and you can go back and you can go into history and you can ask anybody from every war that's ever been fought and that's what the veterans will tell you. Well, at some point it just became about making sure that we all survived. And I turned around and there's the Jesus and Floyd and Saransky and all three of them should have been pulling security and looking that way. And they're all looking back at Earl going, oh. because what do you think is going through David Floyd's mind as a guy who's probably been in the army of all of three minutes and here he is in combat situation way in over his head and the super soldier just got killed. David's thinking, when is it my turn? I'm going next for sure. And he's thinking about his mortality. And I saw, I saw it in his eyes. And I looked at him and said, hey, listen, man, you need to take care of Saransky. Saransky, you need to take care of, I cannot be here. I gotta go up and down the line. I got tons of things I've gotta do. Listen to DeJesus, he's your team leader, he knows what he's doing. And the challenge here, I understand, was that by now DeJesus is speaking Spanglish, man. He's like, Para derecha, Senator, come on, hand Wow. If you can understand what DeJesus just said, you do what he says. But otherwise, y'all know what is right. I've trained you the best I know how. And, I, and I, I, it's got to be the same for a parent or a teacher who okay I know that I sent those people off and did the absolute best I could do with them because those 18 hours that we fought in combat stick in my mind every single day and I don't mean it in a weird sort of Rambo way like where it, I hear voices in my head I don't I, it's I constantly think did I do the right thing did I do enough could I have done something more that would have ensured that someone else made it out of there unhurt because at the end of your day, when, when it's your time to go, you want to know that you did everything right. You don't want to know, you want to have regrets. You want to know that you did everything you could do to make sure that the people around you were taken care of. And if you sent me back in there, given the circumstances, I, I promise you I would do everything exactly the same. Because you train as you fight, and you fight as you train, and you lead by example. And I watched the example of the people around me. They were incredible what they were doing. They were incredible what they were doing. Now, you, everybody, everyone in here has heard stories of greatness, of, of the human being doing amazing things and putting their lives on the line in the name of other human beings. We've, we've all heard it. And, and you always you see it on the news, it's called the ordinary individual who does the extraordinary deed, right? 
You can go down to the Gulf Coast a few years ago and you can hear stories about people who did pretty incredible things to save others during those storms. Just in my little town outside in Nashville, Tennessee, way out in the country, tornadoes leveled it. You should have seen what the neighbors came together and did for each other. Stories of greatness, we've all seen it. I've seen things that can be defined as nothing less than heroic and I, by its truest definition. Doc Strauss was our medic. His ability to stay so calm and tend to the wounded under extraordinary amounts of pressure. He was being shot at directly. And Doc was an odd, odd individual. And, and for, to his credit, I'm going to say his oddness was because of his unlimited access to the medications. But <laughs> Doc, Doc was always trying to figure out a better way to save a life. He always had his nose in a book because he knew he was the one piece of the puzzle that made everything work. Because if Doc couldn't save a life, the millions of dollars that had been spent to send us over there were useless. Doc knew that everything about Task Force Ranger hinged on his ability to do his job. And what he did was extraordinary that day. Sergeant Watson's ability to orchestrate all of us throughout that chaos. You know in the morning when the Humvees came back and the 10th Mountain came back and Rangers came back and Ranger Cooks put on body armor and came in force and mechanics put on body armor and came in force. They put all the wounded people on every vehicle that they had and drove them home. The rest of us had to run out of the city. There were no more rides left. Wasn't happy about it, but we had to do what we had to do. And Sergeant Watson was the only man out of all the people that went in with a certain group of people that brought all his guys back. The only guy who did it. I, it's truly extraordinary. And I'll never forget the video footage that I saw the next day. Remember I told you there was a second crash site, right? Well, there was nobody left to get to it. They told us that at our crash site, we were outnumbered 10 to 1. I'm telling you the truth, the video footage that I saw of that second crash site, there were 200 militia running to that crash. 200. These two men, Gary Gordon and Randy Shugart, were Delta snipers up in the aircraft that was circling over that second crash site. And they knew what they were up against. And they repeatedly volunteered being told, no, we can't risk it, there's not enough backup, you can't go in. And like, look, we don't have enough time, there's still people alive on the crash, we're going in. The helicopter pilot put him down 200 yards away. Those two men sprinted under fire to that crash site and methodically held off the bad guys one by one. Pow! Pow! Now, they're Delta operators. Until they ran out of ammunition. That's, that's how many enemy they were facing. To save one man. It wasn't their buddy. It wasn't their pal. They probably didn't even really know Mike Durant all that well. But Mike Durant's alive today because of those two men. And those two men died fighting to save him. And they were both awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. When I tell you it's a privilege, and I tell you it's an honor to come in and tell their story, man, I mean it from the, I mean it from the bottom of my heart because if I don't tell their story, who will? Because there's not a lot of us from Task Force Rangers that are even given the opportunity to be handed a microphone. So I'm, I'm more than happy to tell you about how great they were. Don't think for one second that any of those people in there were an ordinary individual. And nothing ordinary about anybody who puts on the uniform and puts the boots on. You know why? Because it's a day in and day out commitment to setting an example for others to follow. I believe everybody in here has it in them to do the right thing when that big moment comes. You're gonna. If you were out on a corner and somebody had a car wreck, you would run over there to help them out and you would do the right thing to save that life. But every morning when you get up and you get ready to go into work, you've got, I gotta set an example for others to follow because they're watching me whether they tell you or not. That's the tough part. Do not for one second sell yourself short and ever think that you are an ordinary individual. There is nothing ordinary about you. Man, don't even say it because when you start saying it, you start believing it. And then it becomes an excuse. I'm just an ordinary individual. I don't really make a big difference in this world. And if you don't make a big difference, then what's the use of trying? If I don't need to try, I'm not really doing it. What are you doing here then? You are anything but ordinary. You know that you can go around this planet and there are billions of people on this earth and there is no one else like you. You are a one of a kind. You're a one of a kind model. You have been filled with gifts. All kinds of ways that you can go out there and do good things in the name of humanity. There's, there's this book called the Bible. It's a bestseller. You ought to take a look at it one time. Um, 
there's a chapter in there called Romans, and it's got lots of little motivational things about if you've been given the gift to teach, then by God, go and teach. If you've been given the gift to lead, then lead. You've all been given gifts. Whether you choose to use them, you're going to make a difference in this world whether you know it or not. You're going to make a difference. How you choose to make the difference is up to you. Okay? I know it's not easy. I don't think that it is. I don't claim to say that going out there and doing it on a day-in and day-in basis is an easy thing to do. When we join the Rangers, they make you learn the Ranger Creed, and the very first stanza of the Ranger Creed addresses that very issue. It says, recognizing I volunteered as a Ranger, fully knowing the hazards of my chosen profession. I volunteered, fully knowing the hazards. Now, I don't know if every morning when y'all come into your schools, that they get on the morning announcements and make you guys stand at attention and yell a creed out. That'd be kind of cool, the San Angelo educational creed. Recognizing I volunteered. <laughs> wow. For the San Angelo West Texas School District, fully knowing the hazards of my chosen <laughs> profession, <laughs> whatever they may be. I don't know if you got, if, if you need a creed, I got one for you. It's on the walls of the Delta Compound, it's on the walls of the Ranger Regiment, it's on the walls of just about every special operations unit out there. This again is from the Bible, it's the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. Isaiah 6, 8 reads, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who will go for us and whom shall I send? And I answered. I answered, Here am I, Lord, send me. Send me. See, now, I used to think that that was strictly a military verse. Oh, cool, man, they put something in there for soldiers. <laughs> send me. Yeah, because I don't really have to ask why. I just got to go do the job. But see, I don't carry M4s anymore. I carry Gibson guitars, and you can still send me to use the gifts that I've been given. I've been given the gift of melody. Dave was given the gift to write songs, and he got up here and did something positive with it. I I've been given the ability to tell a story. I've been privileged and blessed with a life where people will listen. So I think I can, I I'll go out there and send me. I'll go do something with it. You all have gifts you've been given. Now, the, 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 the most... The most lasting lesson that I ever learned came on the first day that I walked into the Ranger Regiment. And it was from the Sergeant Major. And he was waiting there for us to come in, all the new guys. And he was from Guam, and his name was Sergeant Major Leon Guerrero. And he, was, he talked like, you know, like the samurai guys in the movies. And he scared me. And he was about this tall. And he says, men, I want to congratulate you all for choosing an honorable and a noble profession. And he's smacking his hands. He goes, and he says, men, I was a, I was a, punk kid. I had no idea what honorable and noble meant. But I do now. And he says, so as many of you are going to go on to long, distinguished careers, he goes, you're going to become part of the long and colorful ranger history. But some of y'all are going to do your time, and you're going to get out, and you're going to go back into the world. And he goes, remember this, wherever it is that you do go, he says, the world needs ranger doctors and ranger lawyers and ranger teachers. And this, that's what he said. <laughs> and I know now what he meant. We don't all have to run around with high and tights and firing squads and shooting everything that moves. No, it's you need to lead and lead by example. It's why the Rangers' motto is Rangers lead the way. Here, come with me for a second. I, want... I could go. I, I found myself. I start preaching. And that's when I know I got to stop and start playing. <laughs> you want to grab me a quarter inch? Thanks, bro. And it's why the Rangers' motto is Rangers lead the way. If you go out there and you make a difference in this world, you do it by the example you set. Now, I'm going to play a song for you. And what's beautiful about today is music doesn't come out of nowhere because we've had some great stuff going on today. And uh, thanks, bro. And you guys are already ready to hear some music. Is that it? This is a song that I choose to play. I get, I get a chance to play one song for you. Now, when you play on the Grand Ole Opry, which is a pretty amazing thing in and of itself, you are told you get to do two songs. All right. You get to play your radio hit, and then you get to play one song that you better choose wisely. You want to kill a second, Dave? And this is a song that I always choose. Now, When, 
When you go over to uh, over on these USO tours, it's a big show, and there's lots of artists, and you get a chance to keep the tempo going. There's a big band, and there's cheerleaders, and they tell you, okay, keep the show up tempo and keep everybody excited. And we do that, and then I'll stop the show and I'll play the song. When you get on a helicopter and you go out to the FOBs, and a FOB, for those of you who don't know, is a forward operating base. And there's a lot less people at a forward operating base than are sitting in this building right now. And we'll walk off a helicopter and all we got is this guitar. And sometimes we don't even have a microphone. And we'll play for them. And this is the song that we play. And it's because in what I just spent 35 minutes talking about, I can sum it up in three and a half with a song. Everybody here wants to make a difference. It's why you chose to do what you do. Everyone here wants to know at the end of the day that what they have done matters. And for those who don't know how to make a difference, I, I tell them, it's an easy thing. All you got to do is lead. You lead by example. You don't have to stand out front and be the person with the, with the eagle and the stars on your collar. You just got to set an example for others to follow because when you do that, the team around you takes notice. I promise you they do. And when you raise your right hand and step forward and say, send me, you've now become part of something much larger than just yourself. You've now become part of a team where everyone's counting on you. And you gotta do the right thing, even when you would rather not. And I will, I could name every person in this song, and it's called Not Me. Now, I know there's a lot of us here, and if we get a chance, the beauty of what I get, get to do is, is not the airlines, it's, it's y'all. If you get a chance, and you can stick it out, come say hey, I, I'd love to meet you and hear your story, hear what you do, all right? And this is a song called Not Me.
just did what I was called to do Do the same if it was you Not me, Lord knows not me But the world becomes a better place Someone stands and leads the way Steps forward when they'd rather say not me Yeah, yeah, steps forward